Well, thank you for joining us. Welcome to Grace. Uh, as we continue our journey through the Bible today, we want to begin by taking a quick look back um, at the book of Judges before we move ahead to the book of Ruth. We didn't really finish. I wanted to say a few things some more about the Judge Samson before we go on. But we've listed the 12 judges here that God raised up to deliver the children of Israel from the oppression they faced as a result of uh, that first bucket of wrath that God promised would come their way if they didn't do as they had sworn they could do, and that's live up to the law of Moses, both faithfully and consistently. Remember, if they failed in one point, they failed the entire thing, and Israel's problem was they thought they could do it. God didn't give them a law that they could, they could satisfy. God gave them a law he knew they couldn't because it was the measure of his justice. And so if they could live up to that law, they, he would consider them righteous, but if they didn't, they would get cursed. And, of course, the five buckets of curses we've already mentioned earlier, and we'll mention them again today. But Israel had sworn that they were not only capable but fully committed uh, to keeping the law of Moses, to keeping that law contract, as I said, faithfully and consistently, never breaking a point. Uh, what they failed to realize when they made that promise to God in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 25, is that by the deeds of the law, how many? No flesh shall be justified in his sight, as the Apostle Paul would later reveal. So contrary to popular religious teaching, both in Israel's day and in ours, God did not give the law to the nation Israel as a pathway by which they might prove their capacity to be something for him. Rather, the law was God's system to prove to his nation their great need of him being something on their behalf uh, and that they could call upon his name. So if the issue was about God's name. God had proven already to the nation the capacity resident in his name. And it's a compound Jehovah names that uh, have meaning, and God is all those things. And so they needed to learn that God's great desire was to exercise his capacity on their behalf and to do so graciously. He did so. We watched him do so through Israel's deliverance from their cap captivity in Egypt, uh, through their 40 years of wandering in the wilderness as he made provision for them. Um, through their conquests over those two giants who were also kings, um, Sion and Og. We, we watched that prior to the Israel crossing the River Jordan. However, having demonstrated who he was on their behalf, the children of Israel were guilty of doing precisely what they had been warned time and time again not to do, and um, in that they were worshiping the false gods of those what we called oppositionites, and you've probably heard about them, the Hizites and Perizzites and Jebusites, and it goes on and on and on, Moabites. Um, they were already in the land, and Israel was to destroy them, and Israel didn't. They let it, many of them live, and God knew what would happen. They would go on to worship the false gods of those oppositionites in the land uh, that they, they failed to destroy. So bucket number one, bucket of wrath number one, as we might call it, had, had, called it, had fallen on the nation just as God predicted it would. Rather than giving Israel the victory over their enemies in the land, God allowed Israel's enemies to oppress them by adverse, adversely affecting Israel's ability to realize the results of the crops that they had sown. So each one of these buckets had issues in it that would begin to plague the nation. And your Bible is laid out according to the issues that are sitting in these buckets of wrath. When you come across those stories in the Old Testament, it's because there's those issues that you're coming across as you read those stories are sitting in those buckets of wrath. In Leviticus chapter 26, we find out about these buckets. Uh, in verse 16, God told Israel that they should, should they merit, bucket of wrath number one, you can see it on the illustration there, through a failure to live up to the dictates of that law contract, the nation would be sowing their seed in vain because their enemies, we called them those oppositionites again, would eat what the Israelites had sown. <clears throat> when bucket of wrath number one fell, that's precisely what happened as, uh, as the people of Israel had no power to overcome their oppressive opposition. So through this continuing cycle of defeat and deprivation of the nation, the people would eventually or should have eventually come to the point of calling upon God to rescue them. Now, we watched the cycle repeat itself again and again in our previous session. As soon as the people of the nation cried out to God, he would graciously exercise his name on their behalf. And he'd provide, he provided particular men. That's the book we looked at previously. What book was that? It's not a trick question. 
<laughs> it was just what, week before last, we were looking at the judges. And so God would raise up these judges and these men were responsible. They, they, they did deliver Israel from their suffering situations. And as long as a judge was alive, Israel did well. Israel began to thrive. But as soon as the judge died, what did Israel do? Right back to worshiping those false gods all over again that were in the land. Uh, so the word judge is the Hebrew shafat, meaning to vindicate or to avenge. Uh, but understand the power of Israel's judges was not a power that had been inherent in any of those men. It was God's power that had been in, that, that was working through those judges as God was the actual deliverer of his people. God was simply working through those men, through those judges, by empowering those men to avenge his nation's cause with their enemies. So it was God that was the actual avenger, and that's one of his names. Um, Jehovah Nissi, God our banner, God our conquering hero, God our avenger. So God would deliver Israel from their enemies. He was their avenger, and he used these judges to do so. Uh, this is the meaning of that compound name, Jehovah Nissi, God our banner, or as it might be said, God our avenger, our conquering hero. In our listing of Israel's judges, we want to take a quick look at the judge who's perhaps the most well-known of all Israel's judges, the judge named Samson. We worked our way all the way up to Samson. Now, many of you have heard of Samson's famous uh, uh, story about Samson is in the Sunday school classes across the country. But the story of Samson takes up four chapters in the book of Judges. And we'll, we'll look at that before we move on to Ruth. Chapters 13 through 16. The reason I want to talk about Samson before moving into Ruth is because Samson's a prime example of what we've seen all along in our journey through the Bible. He's a prime example of God not choosing to use men based upon their behavior, but choosing to use men based upon what God foreknew they would come to believe. The story of Samson begins with the news of Israel's return to worship of the false gods of those who were opposed to uh, Israel's ownership of the land that God had given them. So this time it's the, the Philistines as we enter chapter 13 with verse 1. And as you see there on the on the chart, the six major judges of Israel, uh, the first enemy that was uh, stealing Israel's crops and ruining their crops was Mesopotamia. Then Moab, we're going to hear more about Moab today. Then Canaan, and then the Canaanites, then the Midianites, the Ammonites, and now uh, Philistia, or the Philistines. And <clears throat> we have the years of bondage, uh, uh, that Israel was in bondage, not being able to eat what they'd sown because of these, these countries or these, uh, these ites, oppositionites. We have the judge that God's raised up to deliver them, and we have the number of years of rest that Israel had under each judge and in the scripture reference. So six judges of Israel, the illustration's on our website for anybody who wants to go in and look at it. The Philistines were afflicting Israel. They were sowing their seed, but they couldn't really enjoy the crops because the Philistines were coming in, stealing what Israel had to eat, uh, destroying what they didn't steal. And we come to judge, Judges chapter 13, verses 1 and 2. And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. It's a, it's a continuing song, isn't it? Uh, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines 40 years. God allowed the Philistines to just have their way with Israel's food chain there. And there was a certain man of Zorah, of the family of the Danites. It's a tribe whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren and bare not. So before we move further into the story of Samson, let's take a quick look at the area. Uh, of the land occupied by the Philistines during the time of Israel's judges. Uh, you can see Samson is the final judge there that we're looking at, the 12th judge. And we're looking at that area, as you can see, the work that the judges did going down through Canaan to deliver Israel from their oppression. And we see the final judge, Samson, and we see the area that the Philistines occupied in Canaan. <clears throat> and we're calling this Israel's conquest instruction uh, illustration. It's also on the website. Uh, so on the lower left corner of this map, uh, you see the word Samson appearing in red. Above Samson are the name of some of the other judges with arrows pointing at the oppositionites those judges encountered as they were used of God to reduce Israel's oppression under that first bucket of wrath. So God used Israel's judges in order to demonstrate to the children of Israel that he alone was the answer to the dilemma that they, uh, they contracted for at Mount Sinai when they swore they could keep that law. Um, every time they cried out to him, though, every time they would look to him, knowing their incapacity, 
He delivered them by exercising the capacity resident in his name on their behalf. This is precisely what God was doing when it came to the man named Manoah and Manoah's barren wife. God was ready to provide Israel with a 12th judge, uh, and that 12th judge would be the man named Samson. Notice verses 3 and 5 of chapter 13. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto the woman and said unto her, Behold, now thou art barren, and bearest not, but thou shalt conceive and bear a son. It was not going to be anything she could claim that uh, had been a power resident in her and Manoah. It would be God providing this judge. Uh, for lo, verse 5, thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come on his head. Why not? Because Samson was going to be a Nazarite from birth, uh, one dedicated to serve the Lord. Uh, that was his role. So no razor shall come on his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite unto God from the womb. Now a person could dedicate themselves to, to, to consecrate themselves in a manner of setting themselves apart to serve the Lord. And they could do so. The minimum was 30, uh, I think it was like 30 days. And then they could go back and they could shave and do whatever they wanted to do. But, but here, some were Nazarite from birth. So it was a permanent Nazarite, a Nazarite ship as it's been called. And so now we're reading, the child shall be a Nazarite unto God from the womb and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. So now you see why he's being raised up. Jumping ahead to verses 24 and 25, we read, And the woman bare a son and called his name, and here he is, Samson. And the child grew, and the Lord blessed him. Right off the bat, we see the Lord blessed him, but we don't see him doing anything, do we? Uh, not yet. We don't see any major work for the Lord, but the Lord blessed him. And the Spirit of the Lord began to move him at times in the camp of Dan between Zorah and Eshtaol. The angel of the Lord had already told Manoah's wife that her son would begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. So obviously the Lord in his foreknowledge knew all about Samson and he also knew all about the plans that he had for Samson before Samson ever left the womb. Uh, from verse 24 and 25, we can see that God was working in Samson's life from, the very, from a very early age. Um, hopefully you've noticed that verse 24 ends with the words, and the Lord blessed him. This is important. The question is, did God bless young Samson because Samson always had God's word and God's ways uppermost in his mind? That's what we're going to look at today. Let me ask it a different way. Was Samson a prime example of a man who God could always rely on to do the right thing? and to operate within the parameters of, of God's directions to those of the nation Israel. Uh, was that the case with the patriarchs of the nation as we went through those patriarchs? God never chose to use someone based upon their behavior, only on their belief. Now you might recall that the angel of the Lord, and uh, theophany, uh, many would say this was a, a pre-incarnate Christ, uh, that the angel of the Lord had already given clear direction to the second generation of the nation when he spoke these words to God's people in Judges chapter 2, verse 2. Ye shall make no league with the inhabitants of this land. Stay away from those oppositionites. Don't join hands. Don't fellowship with them. Don't do anything with them. That make no league with the, with the inhabitants of this land. Ye shall throw down their altars, but ye have not obeyed my voice. Why have you done this? Uh, the angel of the Lord was simply repeating God's earlier instructions through Moses in the second giving of the law, the book of Deuteronomy, when Israel was told to abstain from intermarrying with these oppositionites in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 3. Neither shalt thou make marriages with them. In other words, don't marry one of these people that are outside the nation. Don't marry these oppositionites. Uh, Thy daughter shall not give unto his son, nor his daughter shalt thou take unto thy son. So you couldn't let your daughter marry a an oppositionite, and you couldn't let one of their daughters marry your son. It was no intermarriage. You're going to marry, you marry within the land of Israel. Surely God knew that Samson would honor that law contract, and that's why God chose to use him, right, in uh, delivering the nation in the first place. If that's how you've reasoned it, well, you've reasoned it wrong, as is evident when we work our way a little further into the book of Judges. Right after telling us that God blessed Samson in verse 24, and that the Holy Spirit began to move this man in verse 25, the very next verse gives us the mindset of Samson. 
So here it is at the opening of chapter 14 with verse 1. And Samson went down to Timnath and saw a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. And he came up and told his father and mother and said, I have seen a woman in Timnath, Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. Now, therefore, get her for me to wife. Well, that's how marriage worked. It was the representatives of the young couple that made the agreement, the father, the, their representatives. And so it was up to Samson's dad to go get this Philistine woman and, and uh, deliver some vows. And right then, Samson, this, this young Philistine gal would be man and wife. Uh, they wouldn't come together yet. That would begin the espousal period first. But this is what uh, Samson wanted. Go get her. Samson wanted to marry a daughter of the Philistines. What's that tell you about the man Samson? Um, that was judgment failure number one for Samson. But that wouldn't be the final failure at making the sa sound judgment. Secondly, Samson wanted to marry her simply because she was pleasant to the eyes. Oh, that might be nice, but was that the only criteria that Samson used? Because he saw her, he wanted her. That was Samson's second judgment failure, folks. So he, he wasn't uh, perfect in his performance. Now, I don't think that Samson's parents failed to protest their son's proposal plan here with this Philistine lady. The text reveals that they made an impassioned plea for their son to marry only within the ranks of his own nation. Uh, notice the response of Samson's parents in verse 3 to their son's idea of providing them with a Philistine daughter-in-law. Here it is in verse 3. Then his father and mother said unto him, Is there never a woman among the daughters of thy brethren or among all my people that thou goest to take a wife of the uncircumcised Philistines? They knew better, didn't they? They were giving him wise counsel. So what would the right thing be to do for, for Samson if he was going to obey that law contract, honor thy... He should have at least listened. He should have raised a, an argument. Would he listen? Oh, somebody's got some kids of their own. <laughs> would he listen? What do you think? Well, Samson's response in the remainder of verse 3 tells us how readily Samson was to consider his parents' advice. And Samson said unto his father, Get her for me. Wow, who's... Who's giving the orders here? For she pleaseth me well. <laughs> um, that was judgment failure number three for Samson. As the text bears out, he was a determined, a very determined young man. The fact was, God had known Samson's mind far better than Samson had known his own mind. So God's plan was a co to accomplish his own purpose by working through young Samson's lustful determination. Um, Samson did go on to marry that Philistine woman. Um, anyone know her name? Trick question. wasn't Delilah. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> the text tells us that Samson's father, again, against his better judgment, went down to see the woman to whom his son was attracted. Uh, the vows of a marriage relationship, I believe, would have been agreed upon during that visit by Samson's father. And the husband-wife relationship between Samson and this obviously very pretty Philistine woman would have been established right there on the spot. However, as was the common practice of that day, and you know how marriage worked in Israel, uh, what came before the union of the two marriage partners was a period of espousal, sometimes up to a year, sometimes longer. Uh, the husband would go prepare a place for his, for his wife, and she would prove she could remain faithful to the vow she had made to that husband in his absence. Um, even though Samson and the Philistine woman were man and wife, uh, there was yet to be union in that marriage relationship. Uh, but remember, it was a husband-wife marriage relationship from the time the vows had been agreed upon by the representatives of the couple to be joined. Young Samson had himself a wife. Proud as punch, I'm sure. Whenever Samson decided it was time to go and to take his wife, that was Samson's right. She was his wife to take. Uh, of course, Samson had already shown three monumental lapses in judgment, hadn't he? He had married outside the nation, number one. He had married solely on the basis of appearance, number two. And as someone has said, love at first sight is nothing more than lust with potential. Uh, but anyway, add to those two lapses in judgment a third misstep in that Samson totally ignored the sound advice his parents were giving him. Uh, they were sounding the alarm bell, raising a red flag, and Samson just bypassed it. Go get her. She pleaseth me well. Do you suppose that Samson 
had made all the errors in judgment a young man in his quest to satisfy the flesh could possibly make. Or do you think there's more lying at the door for Samson? Um, well, the story doesn't end there, as most of you folks already know. Um, I want you to, um, to continue here with me and see if you can catch Samson's fourth failure as the story continues on. And uh, we're not to the hair part yet, but we're, this is Samson's fourth failure, and I want you to see if you can spot it. Notice verses 5 and 6. Then went Samson down and his father and his mother to Timnath and came to the vineyards of Timnath. And behold, a young lion roared against him. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon Samson. Samson, with all those judgment failures, the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him? Yes, because God wasn't using, using him based upon his behavior. God had chosen Samson to use Samson based upon what God knew Samson would come to believe. And he, Samson, rent, tore that lion apart uh, as he would have rent a kid. And he had nothing in his hand, but he told not his father or his mother what he had done. Anything stand out to anyone here in that passage? Uh, can you spot a possible problem sitting in those two verses? First of all, Samson's parents were against this relationship to begin with. We saw that. They had known better. We already know that. But here we see them going along with the demands of their son as they all head merrily along to the vineyards of Timnath. Now, you might spot a possible problem in this passage if you recall that the angel of the Lord had told Samson's mother that her baby boy would be a Nazarite unto God from the womb. In other words, this wasn't a decision for Samson to make for a time. That Samson would be a Nazarite from birth was God's decision. Now, this brings up a possible problem. <clears throat> for what reason were Samson and his folks going to the vineyards of Timnath? Could it possibly have been for the grapes? What was the main purpose of grapes? The answer is wine. However, according to Numbers chapter 6, verse 3 and 4, anyone taking a Nazarite vow was to abstain from wine. But that wasn't all. You might say, what if they weren't gathering grapes to make wine? Come on, they just liked grapes. They're just going down there to pick some grapes and have a jolly old time. What if they simply liked the taste of grapes and had gone to the vineyards of Timnath to gather some grapes for, the purpose, for a purpose other than drinking? What if they just wanted to eat some grapes? That's innocent enough, is it not? Well, let's visit that passage in Numbers where it talks about Nazarites and grapes. Here it is in verses 3 and 4. He, the one separating himself to vow the vow of a Nazarite, in this case it was God who separated Samson to be a Nazarite, and again from birth, shall separate himself from wine and strong, strong drink, and shall drink no vinegar of wine or vinegar of strong drink, neither shall he drink any liquor of grapes, nor, now catch this, eat moist grapes or dried. Whoa, he was not to eat any grapes, period. All the days of his separation, and how long was Samson separated? From the womb. All the days of his separation shall he eat nothing that is made of the vine tree, from the kernels even to the husk. So by God's own decree, Samson was a Nazarite from birth. So Samson was to avoid grapes altogether. We've got to give Samson the benefit of the doubt here because we don't really know that he ate from the vineyards of Timnath, uh, just that he and his parents had gone there. Perhaps we've seen Samson's final failure, right? He's not going to fail. Uh, not likely. <laughs> Some would say, well, if so, you're right, not likely. See if you can spot another failure in judgment as the passage continues on. This isn't a possible lapse in judgment in verses 8 and 9 coming up. This is a definite misstep by the hirsute hero, we might call him. Tell me if you can find it in Judges chapter 14, verse 8. And after a time, here we come to young Samson again, Samson returned to take her, to take her to take her, to take his wife. She was his wife to take. He had every right to take his wife. And he turned aside to see the carcass of the lion. And behold, there was a swarm of bees and honey in the carcass of the lion. Wow. And he took thereof in his hands and went on eating and came to his father and mother and he gave them and they did eat. But he told them 
told not them that he had taken the honey out of the carcass of a lion. Why wouldn't he tell his folks that he'd taken the honey out of the carcass of a lion? Why do you suppose he kept the source of the honey a secret from his father and mother? Was there a purpose behind Samson's self-imposed secrecy or silence? The answer is yes, there was. To discover the reason, we need to return to that book of Numbers again where we find something else that was taboo for a Nazarite to do. Look with me at chapter 6, verse 6. All the days that he separated himself, the Nazarite, unto the Lord, in Samson's case, once again from birth, by the Lord's own decree, he shall come at no dead body. Certainly, God would use Samson to conquer and to slay in order to relieve Israel's oppression from their opposition in the land. But to approach a person or an animal after death was something that a Nazarite was not to do. Samson was eating honey that he found where? Inside the carcass, I put dead carcass, I kind of doubled it up there, of the lion. And he took thereof in his hands, verse 9 stated. Samson had to reach into that carcass of that lion in order to retrieve the honey. So Samson was clearly out of line once again, and Samson knew it. So he didn't tell his mother and his father, who would have clearly known that he was a Nazarite. The mother had been told he was a Nazarite from birth. He didn't tell them where he found the honey. Now we know why he didn't tell them. That was definitely failure in judgment number four for Samson. And there were more judgment failures at Samson's door. Now the question we need to answer at this point is, did God choose to use Samson as one of Israel's judges based upon Samson's behavior? What have we seen throughout our journey through the Bible thus far? It was never about a man's performance. It was always about a man's belief. Uh, the answer is obvious. Those of you who know the rest of the story know that Samson went on to try to con connive his way into some free clothing from some of the Philistine companions. Now, was there an error there? See something there? His Philistine companions, they're to make no league with those oppositionites. And now here Samson's got Philistine companions, and he's going to use a riddle to see if he can win a wager and, and get some free clothing. Or was it really about the free clothing? Or was it more about Samson showing how wise he was that he could fool all these Philistine companions? Uh, this is where Samson's espoused wife enters the scene. <clears throat> the Philistine men that Samson tried to convince, or connive rather, out of the, some free clothing, and I, I'm sure, to, in my mind, any way to show off how wise he was through the ruse of that riddle he employed, those men threatened to kill Samson's wife by burning her, and this burning her up. <laughs> Uh, they were going to burn her and her father and her father's house, everything they had, unless she could get Samson to reveal the, the answer to his riddle and then relay that information to them. They threatened her. What choice did she have? Well, she could have told Samson the fate she was facing. If he had married from within the nation, he possibly would have had a wife that said, don't we rely upon the Most High God? What about your strength, Samson? I think you can handle some companions here. So she did have a choice. Uh, if Samson's God had been her God, and surely Samson would have been strong enough to handle those threatening men, but that isn't the approach she took. Instead, she cried for a week. Now, that doesn't usually happen with the ladies, does it? <laughs> she cried for a week saying, you don't love me. You hate me. Because you haven't told me the answer to your riddle. Samson wouldn't fall for that, would he? Wouldn't that be a little manipulation? Nah, Samson wouldn't fall for that. He did. He did. And he had to pay up because his wife took the answer to that riddle straight back to the men to whom he had posed it. Uh, you can imagine his anger when they knew the answer. And Samson knew where they had gotten that answer. In verse 18 of chapter 14, Samson told them, If ye had not plowed with my heifer, ye had not found out my riddle. <laughs> More sitting there than we think. So the fact that his wife had betrayed him wasn't something of which Samson was unaware. He knew she would betrayed him. He knew full well what she had done. She'd been unfaithful to the man to whom she was espoused, betrothed. You'd think he'd be a little angry at that wife, wouldn't you? I mean, no union yet. So he had every right to put her away. She'd been an unfaithful wife. What did Samson do? He went and slew 30 Philistine men, <laughs> took, to, took out his revenge. 
and he took the clothing from those men in order to satisfy his lost bet with the people he'd, he'd made that wager. What about Samson's wife who'd betrayed him? Was Samson not at all displeased with her deception? Uh, the answer is apparently not because Samson was ready to take a spousal to the next level as we come to the entrance of Judges chapter 15 where we read in verse 1, but it came to pass within a while after in the time of wheat harvest that Samson visited his wife with a kid. Now she's being rewarded. Visiting her because they were still in the time of a spousal. Union having not taken place yet. And he said, I will go into my wife, into the chamber. Here's where a union would have taken place. But her father would not suffer and would not allow Samson to go in. Judges 15, 2. And her father said, I verily thought that thou hast utterly hated her. Therefore I gave her to thy companion. <laughs> Is not her younger sister fairer than she? Take her, I pray thee, instead of her. So now her father has given Samson's wife to his companion. If you thought Samson was angry that he'd lost his wager and the injury to the pride, his pride that that had brought about, now the one he thought to have been his friend was the one to whom his showpiece wife belonged. She's his friend's eye candy now. <laughs> hmm. Talk about a blow to the pride nature. Samson had taken a huge ego hit with what had just happened. According to the narrative in Judges chapter 15, he went out and caught 300 foxes. Now, if this man had the Holy Spirit working on his behalf, that wouldn't be too difficult a thing to do. And he joined them together at the tails, two by two, and he attached a torch to each set, uh, which, as you might imagine, caused no small stir in the minds of those frightened foxes. <clears throat> now, there's been a lot of depictions of this, and uh, you have to choose which one. This, this is just one artist's rendition, but... Can you picture the havoc wreaked by these 300 frantic torch-bearing foxes where Sam, when Samson released them into the standing cornfields of the Philistines? But what had the Philistines been doing in all those oppositionites all along? Keeping Israel from eating what Israel had sown. Is God avenging his nation's cause with his people, with their enemies rather, when now he's destroying the enemy's crops? You see why these judges were raised up? When the Philistines asked for the name of the perpetrator of this destruction of their, their fields, it was revealed that Samson had been the one responsible. And all because his Philistine father-in-law gave Samson's espoused wife to Samson's friend. Uh, and because of that, the Philistines set fire to both Samson's wife. They went and found the wife. And they burned her, and they burned her father, Samson's father-in-law after which Samson smote them with a great slaughter, the Bible says, according to the text, chapter 15. So you can see how with his foreknowledge of Samson's thinking, God was working through the failure of a man he knew would fail to avenge the cause of his people with the Philistines who'd been oppressing his nation for 40 years while Israel was suffering the consequences of that first bucket of wrath. They had contracted for that bucket when they swore at Mount Sinai that they could keep the law both faithfully and consistently, and that bucket had certainly fallen. And so we see that food issue taking place, um, crop issues throughout these stories in the book of Judges, as Israel sowing their seed in vain was a major component of bucket number one. <clears throat> it was only when Israel cried out to the Most High God that God raised up these judges to avenge the cause of his nation and with those oppressing them. Uh, such was the case with Samson. God, our avenger. God, our Jehovah Nissi. It becomes very apparent as we read through these stories that God didn't choose to use Samson based upon Samson being a shining example of performance perfection. Uh, Samson was the precise opposite. Uh, he was arrogant, headstrong, uh, always bent on choosing the course that was wrong rather than the opposite way around. Uh, if you need further proof, all you need to do is continue following the story of Samson. We saw how he chose to marry a wife outside the nation, how he totally disregarded the direction offered by his parents who had, um, had raised him, how he compromised his Nazarite position by putting his hands into the dead body of a lion, how he employed the ruse of a riddle in order to appear wise among the Philistines um, that he befriended, and he wasn't supposed to be befriending them, how he succumbed to manipulation failing to consider the consequences of such an unsound decision when it came to his telling the wife the answer to the riddle. Yet in spite of the numerous faulty choices of the man, God was able to use Samson for the purpose of exercising his name 
on behalf of the people of his nation. He didn't choose to use Samson once again based upon Samson's stellar performance or behavior. He knew Samson's behavior would be otherwise. Samson was God's man because God foreknew what Samson would believe. In chapter 15, we find Samson slaying a thousand Philistines with a jawbone of an ass. Wow. After which he suffered extreme thirst. Now this guy's thirsty. Notice to whom Samson credits that conquest and, and who he sought for his own deliverance from that thirsty condition in verse 18. And he was sore athirst and he called on the gods of the Philistines. Nope. He called on the Lord and said, Thou hast given this great deliverance into the hand of thy servant. He knew the source of the power. And now shall I die of thirst and fall into the hand of the uncircumcised? Of course, God met Samson's need by exercising his name on Samson's behalf. He filled the hollow of that jawbone Samson had used to slay those Philistines with water in order to sustain the man he was using to deliver the nation from their Philistine oppression. The oppression associated with that first bucket of wrath Israel contracted for at Mount Sinai. Samson knew that the Most High God would be the source of his deliverance. And he called upon the Lord, according to verse 18. This is what Israel's education and the meaning of God's name was all about. Uh, it wasn't about the inherent goodness of the man named Samson. It was about the inherent capacity and goodness resident in the name of the Most High God. By the end of chapter 15, I believe that Samson had come to understand that and to rely solely upon that. Of course, that didn't mean that Samson had now become a package of performance perfection. Even though he knew and trusted in the Most High God. Just two verses removed from verse 18, where Samson was calling upon the Lord, giving him all the credit, we come to Judges chapter 16. It's only two verses away. And notice the behavior of Samson the believer. We'll look at the final verse of chapter 15 and immediately follow that up with the first verse of chapter 16. And he judged Israel the days of the Philistines 20 years. Then went Samson to Gaza and saw their harlot and fled as fast as his feet could carry him. And went in under her. <laughs> Come on, Samson, get with the program. Samson was definitely God's man. Not because Samson was good, but because Samson believed in the Most High God. You can read the remaining story of Samson in Judges chapter 16, where we find that God doesn't remove the earthly consequences of a person's earthly choices. Uh, Samson would be manipulated all over again by a new love. This time around, the object of his affections was the na woman named Del Delilah, which we're all familiar with. And most of you know how that story ends. By succumbing to Delilah's manipulation, Samson was captured, he was blinded, and as the Philistines were gathered together in the temple of their false god, Dagon, in order to offer a great sacrifice to this false god for delivering Samson into their hands, Samson cried out once again, Notice the direction of his plea in verse 28. And what does God do when Israel cries out to him? Judges 16, 28. And Samson called unto the Lord and said, O Lord God, remember me, I pray thee, and strengthen me, I pray thee, only this once, O God, that I may be at once avenged. Here, see that word? Jehovah, you be my Jehovah Nissi. That I may be at once avenged of the Philistines for my two eyes. What did God do for the judge that God used to avenge his cause with the enemy of his nation? He avenged Samson's cause with that enemy. Uh, he exercised his Jehovah Nissi name on Samson's behalf. And as most of you are aware, Samson, empowered by the Most High God, was able to topple the two main pillars upon which that false temple stood. And this is a story that most people are familiar with right here, another artist's rendition. By the end of his life, Samson clearly understood the meaning of God's name and the necessity of calling upon and relying upon God to exercise his name on, Satan's behalf, or on Samson's behalf, and to do it how? Graciously. How about the rest of the nation of Israel? Unfortunately, they were continuing to fail the education God had been providing them in the meaning of his name. Uh, the telling verse, as we leave the book of Judges and move into the book of Ruth, is, is the final verse recorded in the book of, uh, the men, of the men that God used to deliver his nation. Judges chapter 21, uh, verse 25. In those days there was no king in Israel, Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Do you see the direction of the nation? We've now come to the book of Ruth. 
Ruth is a very short book, being only four chapters long. We could have read it while we were talking this morning, probably twice. But it's a book jam-packed with human emotion, based, of course, on the sound doctrine resident in the meaning of God's name, because it's all about God's name. As we enter the book of Ruth, remember that we're sitting in the days of the outpouring of that first bucket of wrath that Israel contracted for. Uh, that bucket of wrath that said there's going to be food issues, serious food issues. You're going to sow your seed, not enjoy it. Um, bucket of wrath number one had indeed fallen, and it was the backdrop of the book of Judges, as we've just seen. So we should expect Ruth sitting right there in that same section we should expect the issue of food shortage to continue to be the storyline in the book of Ruth. And it is. <laughs> we see that to be the case as we begin with chapter 1, verse 1. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled, we just read Judges, didn't we, that there was a famine in the land. I guess so. Why? The first bucket of wrath had fallen on the nation. And a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, in its simple form, just simply Bethlehem, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. Anyone remember the country of Moab? They weren't very friendly, were they, uh, to Israel? Um, didn't they want to get Israel cursed through Balaam? Uh, verse 2, and the name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi. I'm pronouncing them as they look instead of as they, the proper pronunciation, but that's okay. And the name of his two sons... Mayon and Kilion, Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Judah. And they came into the country of Moab and continued there. Now let's take a quick look at the people we're considering here in this passage. Elimelech, according to those who study Bible ancestry, was from the tribe of Judah. The fact that he and his wife Naomi are described as being Ephrathites or Ephraimites from Ephraim, are, are both words meaning the same thing, tell us they had simply been dwelling in the land given Ephraim. Or, or could, we could consider the fact that though they were of the tribe of Judah, they had some family ties with the folks of the, the line of Ephraim. We know they did going back to Jacob, but you might recall that as a reward for Joseph's rescue of his father and his brothers in Egypt, uh, Joseph was given two portions of the land, and those portions were given to his sons. One was Ephraim, the other Manasseh. So these folks were dwelling in the portion of the land given Ephraim, but they were from the tribe of Judah. The important thing to keep in mind at this point, and this is the whole, the whole reason for that, is that Elimelech and his wife, Naomi, were not Gentiles. They were most definitely members of the nation Israel, and they had two sons, Malion and Kilion. We might say, so far so good. These folks are keeping it in the family. Right? It's all in the family right now. Uh, but things were about to change. Due to a shortage of food in Canaan, which we can attribute to that first bucket of wrath that had fallen upon the nation, Elimelech and Naomi decided to take, up, take their sons, gather their belongings, and journey to where? To Moab, where they took up residence. Ooh, major mistake. This is where the waters began to be a bit murky for Elimelech, the Elimelech family, as you can see on our Ruth from Moab to Boaz illustration. The first significant event after the family arrived at Moab was the death of Elimelech, as recorded in verse 3. And Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left, and her two sons. Interestingly enough, the scriptures are strangely silent um, as to how or why Elimelech died. That makes me wonder. I'm sure this left some to question whether Elimelech's death was judgment-related in that he had taken his wife to, to settle in Moab in the first place. Moab was in a cursed position by God at this point in time. They were never, no Moabite or Ammonite was to enter the congregation of Israel. They were in a cursed position. But we don't know why Elimelech died. We're not told that. What we do know is that his demise didn't catch God by surprise because God's plan was to work through the tragic events of that family <coughs> to accomplish God's greater purpose. Um, <coughs> pardon me. After their father died, his two sons decide to take wives. They're going to get married. Now, we notice the choice these bo boys made for wives when we come to verse 4. Here we are. And they took them wives of the nation Israel. 
And they took them wives of the women of Moab. The one was Orpah, in the name of the other, Ruth. Ah, the one that we're reading about. And they dwelled there about ten years. Now the events take an even stranger turn. For some reason that once again God chose not to reveal, both of Naomi's sons died, which left Naomi with only her two Moabite daughters-in-law, Ruth and Orpah. Could the death of Elimelech's sons have had anything to do with the fact that they also chose to marry Moabite women? Only God knows the answer to that. What we do know from the outcome of the story is that God had a plan to work through Naomi's sorrowful situation to accomplish his greater purpose with those people. After the death of her sons, Naomi decided to leave Moab. Time to leave Moab, return back to the land of Judah, her homeland, because she had heard that God had visited his people by giving them bread. How had God visited his people by giving them bread? Through the use of those judges that we just read about in the book of Judges. Somewhere along the way, back to Judah, Naomi rethought the wisdom of taking Orpah and Ruth with her because, as Naomi put it, the hand of the Lord is against me. So she instructed them to turn back to Moab and to the people of the land that they were from. Those of you who know the story know that Orpah did indeed return to her pe people and to the false gods of the Moabites. The same uh, would not be so with the daughter-in-law Ruth. Let's join the account in verse 14, chapter or, uh, Chapter 14, read. verse 14 of chapter 1, here it is. And they lifted up their voice and wept again. These three were very close. Obviously, they loved Naomi and she loved both of them. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clave unto her. And Naomi said, Behold, thy sister-in-law has gone back unto her people, catch this, and unto her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. It wasn't that Naomi had turned against the Most High God in which she believed. Naomi's problem was that she began believing that the Most High God had turned against her. Ruth's reply gives us some insight into Ruth's mindset regarding her love for her mother-in-law. Here it is beginning in verse 16. And Ruth said, Entreat me not, don't, don't ask me to leave you, or to return from following after you. For wherever you go, I'm going to go. And where you lodgest, I'm going to lodge. Thy people shall be my people. And catch this, thy God my God. Wow. Where thou diest, will I die, and there will I be buried. And Lord, do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. Wow, was she a devoted daughter-in-law. It's not difficult to make some great applications here. Uh, and probably we should do so. We, we don't do that enough, probably. But I'm sure you've noticed how Naomi's love and concern for her daughter-in-law not only affected Ruth's love for Naomi, but how that love also impacted a Ruth to believe in the God in which her mother-in-law believed. It's often been said concerning our ambassadorship of the gospel of Christ that people won't care a thing about how much we know unless they first know how much we care. And that's very true. And we can see it right here with Naomi and Ruth. As believers in the gospel of Christ, the example we set in our labor of love on behalf of the lost can go a long way when it comes to our ability to impact those who are the focus of our love with the gospel we believe. Um, it shouldn't be difficult for, for anyone to see the application sitting here when we consider the impact Naomi's love for Ruth had on drawing Ruth to the God in which Naomi believed. Uh, Ruth wanted to, be, uh, wanted to be numbered with Naomi's people. And Ruth, Ruth wanted Naomi's God to be her God. And nothing was going to stand in Ruth's way. Uh, Ruth chapter 1 ends with verse 22. So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law with her, which returned out of the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem in the beginning of barley harvest. Chapter 2 opens with some hopeful news, uh, as Ruth saw it at least, because uh, it would affect Naomi and Ruth's ability to eat. After all, the two of them were having to fend for themselves now. The men were gone. Let's read verses 1 and 2. And Naomi had a kinsman of her husband, a relative, a mighty man of wealth of the family of Elimelech. And his name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite said unto Naomi, Let me now go to the field and glean ears of corn after him, in whose sight I shall find grace. And Naomi said unto her, Go, my daughter. You'd think she'd say, Go, my daughter-in-law. How close was she to this daughter-in-law? Go, my daughter. Who was this Boaz? What kind of a man was he? 
And from where did he come? Well, think back for a moment to that lady of the evening that hid the two spies sent by Joshua to search out that land prior to Israel's crossing of the River Jordan. Can you remember the name of that, that lady who housed those two spies? Rahab, absolutely right. James would later refer to her as Rahab the harlot. She hid the spies in those stalks of flax on a rooftop, after which Joshua's forces protected her and her family during their, that conquest in Jericho. Well, Salmon, if you follow the list down from Jacob, one of his sons, fourth son was Judah, follow the, the uh, children of Judah, right on down the line you come to Salmon at the bottom left side of the chart. Salmon, guess who he married? He married the harlot Rahab. <laughs> Isn't that something? And so they had a son, and that son's name was Boaz. Now we see what's going to happen here. Guess who Naomi's husband, Elimelech's wealthy kinsman, happened to be? Boaz. <laughs> As it turns out it was none other than Boaz, the son of Salmon and Rahab, the former harlot. Of course, Boaz was up in years. By the time Ruth thought of that being a relative of her father-in-law, Imelech, Boaz might show kindness to her by letting her glean the fallen ears of corn in the field. So look back at what might be called the gleaner's law for a moment in Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 9. When thou cuttest down thy harvest in thy field and hast, for, hast forgot a sheaf in the field, thou shalt not go again to fetch it. It shall be for the stranger for the fatherless and for the widow, that the Lord thy God may bless thee in all the work of thy hands. Israel was to allow the gleaning of their fields. From the narrative of the story of Ruth, we can gather that she came to know something about the gleaner's law because she told her mother-in-law she wanted to go to the field of Boaz, her father's kinsman, during the time of harvest, and that hopefully, being a relative, Boaz would allow her to glean from the field and those two would be able to eat. Now, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the artist's depiction of the gleaners. You see it there in front of you. Uh, you may even have a print of this. But not only were the gleaners to be permitted to gather that which was dropped behind during the harvest, the Israelites were to allow their land to lie fallow every seventh year. For what purpose? So the poor, the hungry, the widows could come in and glean those crops that would come up on their own during that time where the land was lying fallow. To show you a little something about the character of this man named Boaz, Listen to his response to Ruth's request to glean in his field, as it's recorded in chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. Then said Boaz to Ruth, Hearest thou not, my or hearest thou not, my daughter? Do you not hear me, my daughter? He's calling her his daughter. Go not to glean in another field, neither go from hence, but abide here fast by my maidens. Let thine eyes be on the field that they do reap. And go out after them. Stay in my field. Harvest from my field. Have I not charged the young men that they shall not touch thee? And when thou art athirst, go unto the vessels and drink of that which the young men have drawn. Uh, from that which the young men have drawn. Not only was Boaz a compassionate man, he understood the responsibility of a kinsman when it came to the widow of a relative. Of course, Ruth didn't know that Boaz was aware of that Elimelech was her father-in-law and that Elimelech's late son uh, had been her husband. Ruth didn't know if he knew about the connection yet. So Ruth asked Boaz the reason for his kindness to her. Listen to his response in verses 11 and 12. And Boaz answered and said unto her, It hath been fully showed me all that thou hast done unto thy mother-in-law since the death of thine husband, and how thou hast left thy father and thy mother in the land of thy nativity, and art come unto a people which thou knowest not heretofore. You didn't know us before this. Verse 12, The Lord recompense thy work, and a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel. Listen to this. Under whose wings thou art come to trust, Ruth. He knew what she believed, didn't he? Ruth, a Moabite by birth, had apparently come to know more about God's name than did the nation God had led into the land that he had given them in the first place. And Boaz had come to know more about Ruth than Ruth had ever realized that he had known. Boaz didn't stop with allowing Ruth to glean the fallen corn. He said, eat with the harvesters that I've hired with my men. You eat with them. And then he instructed those men not only not to touch her, but to not say anything about what she picked up and to allow her to go on and glean from the standing corn. She didn't have to wait till they dropped it. She could harvest right along with them if she wanted to. He was taking care of Ruth. 
when Naomi realized that how well Boaz was treating Ruth, she told Ruth what she wanted her to do. Notice her instructions to her daughter-in-law beginning in chapter 3, verse 2. And now is not Boaz our kindred? He's our relative. With whose maidens thou wast? Behold, he winnoweth barley tonight in the threshing floor. Wash thyself, therefore, and anoint thee, and put thy raiment on. Now, in today's language, we wouldn't say it that way. We'd say, clean up, dress up, and a little fragrance will go a long way. <laughs> Get thee down to the floor, the floor where the harvest was stored. But make not thyself known unto the man until he shall have done eating and drinking. But wait, there's more. Look at verses 4 and 5. And it shall be when he lieth down that thou shalt mark the place where he shall lie. And thou shalt go in and uncover his feet and lay down there. And he will tell thee what thou shalt do. And she said unto her, All that thou sayest unto me I'm going to do. She was heeding her mother-in-law's advice. After Boaz fell asleep, Ruth did precisely what she was told to do. Now don't think that Boaz made any, any untoward advances toward Ruth. He did not. That wasn't his character. He would never breach her moral virtue. He knew about her moral virtue. Instead, we read in verse 9, and he said, Who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth, thine handmaid. Spread therefore my skirt over thine hand, thy skirt over my, thine handmaid. Exactly what we're told God did with Israel. For thou art a near kinsman. And he said, Blessed be thou of the Lord, my daughter, for thou hast showed more kindness in the latter end than at the beginning, inasmuch as thou followest not young men, which whether poor or rich. He was an old man. And she was a young lady. Boaz knew precisely what Ruth was suggesting by saying, cover me with your skirt. She was requesting that Boaz perform the role of the kinsman redeemer where she personally was concerned. Now, what was that all about? Well, the law of Moses contained the provision that if a brother died, leaving a widow with no children, that the brother of the one who died was required to take his deceased brother's widow to be his own wife. Thus, not only providing financial security for that widow, but any son born of that new relationship would be considered the son of the deceased brother's estate, thus preserving the name of that brother. This was a way of protecting not only the widow in those days, but also the continuance of the family structure. That was known as the law of leveret marriage. But there was another facet of the law to consider. The law of redemption stated that the closest living relative could purchase a deceased relative's property Everything that he had could be purchased by the closest relative. After all legal debts were then satisfied on that, what belonged to that deceased person, the property and all that belonged to the dead person, to the one being redeemed, became the legal possession of the relative who had redeemed it. Paid it off, paid for it, and owned it. When we carry this over to the book of Ruth, folks, we see that Boaz became the kinsman redeemer of not only Naomi, hus Naomi's husband, Elimelech, but also the kinsman redeemer of Ruth's hu dead husband, Elimelech's son. Boaz was actually the second closest relative to Naomi and Ruth's deceased husbands. But being the man of character that he was, he knew there was a closer relative. So he had to offer everything that, that Ruth and Naomi's husbands had had he had to offer to the closest relative the first opportunity to purchase. And the, the closer relative said, no. <laughs> I think he would, like to buy the, would have liked to buy the field, but he didn't want the women that came along <laughs> and the responsibility of the women that came along with the field. Boaz did. Ruth 4, 9. And Boaz said unto the elders and to all the people, Ye are witnesses this day that I have bought all that was Elimelech's and all that was Chil Chilion's and Malone's of the hand of Naomi. Moreover, Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of Malon, or Malion, have I purchased to be my wife, to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance. The name of the dead be not cut off from among his brethren and from the gate of his place. Ye are witnesses this day. What makes this story more fascinating to me is the fact that those Moabites had been under a curse. No Moabite could enter the congregation of Israel. How did a cursed Moabite get into the line of the Messiah? The answer is because God provided a redeemer. Isn't that interesting? God provided a redeemer. Or she could never have been in. So whether you realize it or not, this all goes back to God's name. 
and God showing himself, showing his name, exercising his name on behalf of those that he exercised his name and doing it graciously. What a lesson as Israel could go back and read these stories. God knew that Israel would need him to be some things for them. He became their provider. Their Jehovah Nissi, not only their conquering hero, but their Jehovah Yira, their provider. He provided them for them in, in an additional way and through that gift of his son, Jesus Christ, at Calvary. So Moab is a great illustration, a great picture of the redemption that now we know through the Apostle Paul was carried out for the entire world. God became the Savior of the world, not just believers, but of the world as he delivered the entire world from the debt of their sin. They will not be in hell, even unbelievers, for the sins that Christ paid for. They'll be there because they did not accept the one who paid for their sins. Quite a difference. Wow. We have a few minutes here. I'm going to just read this, Ruth 14, or 4, 13 and 14, to close it out. So Boaz took Ruth, and she was his wife. And when he went in unto her, the Lord gave her conception, and she bare a son. And the women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, which hath not left thee this day without a kinsman, that his name may be famous in Israel. What about Christ's name, folks? Do you see a picture here? And he shall be unto thee a restorer of thy life. What about Jesus Christ? Do you see a picture? And a nourisher of thine old age for thy daughter-in-law, which loveth thee, which is better to thee than seven sons, hath borne him. And Naomi took the child, laid it in her bosom, and became nurse unto her daughter-in-law's child. And the women, her neighbors, gave it a name, saying, There is a son born to Naomi, and they called his name Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. And I believe we all know who came from the line of David. Who was it? Wow, what a story. And if it were not for what happened to Christ at Calvary, we would say, and they all lived happily ever after. <laughs> but they really did. Christ rose from the dead, victorious. And through that, we know his death, burial, and resurrection, our sins were fully paid for, totally satisfying the justice of God Almighty for every sin Christ bore in himself, and he bore the sins of the world upon himself, satisfying the Father's justice for those sins when he took our place, died in our place for our sins. God is not going to collect a debt twice. He is not waiting to save you. He's not waiting to save anybody. The decision was already yes before you were ever born. Your sins were taken off of you before you ever drew a breath. He's not waiting to take your sins away. He's not waiting to forgive you. He's waiting for you to accept what his son did on your behalf. It's as simple as that. The religious world likes to make a whole lot more of it because they want to keep the issue of sins on the table of God's justice. And if they can teach a little guilt and keep you aware of the sin, they figure they've got their thumb on you and they can control your behavior a little bit. Love is a greater motivator. Christ took all the sins off the world at Calvary. The moment we trust in that, the Holy Spirit joins us to Christ and what belongs to him belongs to us. And that's how we're righteousified, made righteous, so that we can dwell with him forever. You folks know the story. We go over it just about every week here. Let's close in prayer. Thank God for what we've learned. It's a marvelous book, this book of Ruth. There's much more we could have said. Uh, but we'll move on now, and we'll go into to, uh, the next.